Well, hello, hello. We are in our second week of a preaching series we're calling Sex, Sexuality, and Gender. Because we figured if we're going to talk about this stuff, might as well just tell you we're going to talk about it. And, uh, and, and these may seem like some odd topics to talk about in church, but it's important for us to talk about these because God actually, actually created, designed humanity with these things in mind. He created us with, with sexuality and gender. And, and believe it or not, God actually created sex and he created it for us. He created it for us to, to enjoy within a certain context. And so, so we're going to talk about these things Um, If you missed last week's message, we started the series. Our lead pastor, Tony, did a really fantastic, beautiful job of starting the series talking about grace and truth and how Jesus came to us from the Father, full of both grace and truth. And as we're becoming disciple makers of Jesus, we are also learning what it means to live into the fullness of God's truth and his grace as well, so we're we're gonna we're gonna talk about these things, and, and that's part of the reason why is they're, they're part of, part of God's design. Um, another reason why we're gonna talk about these things is because these these tend to be three of the biggest uh, obstacles for some people in receiving the good news of Jesus, especially young people. These tend to be obstacles, and I don't think they're obstacles because God's design is flawed. I think they tend to be obstacles because I think the church just in general has, has given a pretty cheap version of what God's design is like. And God really has a masterful, beautiful design for us in these things. I think another reason why these tend to be obstacles is when we have these conversations in church, we tend to, to for the most part, leave out single people from the conversation. If you're single, maybe you've, maybe you've heard the church talk about Jesus is the bread of life. You can be fully satisfied in him. And then you, then you hear a marriage about, about sex or you hear, you're a message about sex and marriage and you, and you somehow feel like, oh, well, well, man, it feels like that's the, the main thing. That's the, that's where the action's at. And you feel like, well, wh- well what about me? And, and, and I just want you to know that we, today we're going to talk about marriage. We're going to talk about sex, but that is not the main thing. Not even close. Jesus is the main thing. And whether you're married or not, you can be fully satisfied in Christ. Um, and so single people, I've been thinking about you as I've been preparing for, for this message. It's, you're on my heart. This is not a message for you to listen to because, you know, maybe someday you'll be married. No, no. This is for you and for all of us exactly where you are. Um, I also want to acknowledge that we do have some 7th through 12th graders in the room with us, and I was a youth pastor for a long time, so I know, I've talked with, you know, teenagers about sex and sexuality many times. I know you can handle the content. Um, probably the bigger challenge is that for some of you, you maybe never imagined you'd be in a room like this hearing a pastor talk about sex and sexuality while you're sitting next to your parents. Um, just, just so you know, your parents also probably never imagined being in a room like this talking about sex sitting next to you. Um, and, and I never imagined I'd be in front of a camera knowing my parents are watching this. So hi, mom. Uh, just, so just, there's a little bit of discomfort for all of us. Just acknowledge that. Uh, but it's important for us to have 7th through 12th graders in the room because these conversations around sex, sexuality, and gender are happening in every other space that they're in. But in those spaces, they are probably not acknowledging that God actually created this. And they're probably not acknowledging that God actually gave us some guidelines for how to best enjoy and live into his design in these things. So we're going to talk about them. And I am extremely confident in what scripture says about these things. What I don't know is all of your stories. And I know that these topics tend to be emotionally charged because of, of the experiences we have. And, and I can't know all of your stories, but I can let you know that, that I'm sensitive to that. And, you, you know, all, all the potential stories that have been on my heart as I've been preparing this. And, and I just want you to know that, please forgive me if I say something that, that doesn't sit well with you. But would you also come and tell me? Because I'd love to, to be able to apologize if I say something that, that doesn't sit well with you. Uh, I'm just going to ask you to have grace for me. I'm going to ask we have grace for each other. Parents, have grace for your kids as they... Work this stuff out. Kids, have grace for your parents. As some of them are, are honestly, they're, they're wrestling with sex and sexuality as it relates to their faith, per, perhaps for the very first time. And let's all of us, whether you're married, you're, you're single, you're widowed, you're divorced, you're, 
you're dating, engaged, not interested in a romantic relationship, let's all of us open our hearts and minds to what God has for us in this conversation. Let's pray. Um, Father God, uh, we, as, as we open our hearts and minds to you, we just ask that you pour over us your, the fullness of your grace and your truth. And God, may we receive and be filled with what you have for us today. And personally for me, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. You are my strength. You are my redeemer. Amen. Well, as we uh, talk about God's design, I don't think there's a better place to start than in the beginning. So let's go to the very beginning. The very first verse of the Bible goes like this. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And God just goes, he starts creating all this stuff, and he's just having a great time. And at the end of every day where God creates stuff, he just looks at what he created that day, and he goes, wow, like, that, that's good. And he's just so impressed with all the stuff he's creating. And then he gets to the sixth day, and he creates a human. And on the sixth day when he creates a human, he's like, this, there's a whole different vibe to that day. He's like, oh, this is, this, this man was, he, he's created in my image and in my likeness, which means, get this, Adam was like God in like every way, like mind, soul, body, spirit. He's like, this is, this is, this is like me. And he looks at Adam and he goes, now that, now that is really, really good. And everything was just good. And then a few lines later, we read for the very first time that the Lord God said, it is not good. And what was not good? It was not good for the man to be alone. So God made a commitment to the man. He says, I will make a helper suitable for him. And then he brings all these different animals before Adam. And none of them were a suitable helper for him. So God does something really incredible. He actually, he actually creates a whole nother human. Also, in his image and in his likeness, he creates this, this human to be a perfect partner for Adam and, and, and someone that Adam would be a perfect partner for her. And Eve was, was very, very much like Adam. I mean, she's still created in the image of God and likeness of God. But she also is distinctly different from Adam. She was not a clone. She was a partner. So God creates Eve, and it says that he brought her to the man. And as soon as Adam sees Eve, he like launches into poetry. He starts going, he goes, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And Adam's just so excited. And, and in the very next verse, we get the, the biblical, the, the first biblical description of what marriage was designed to be. It says, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. This is the biblical definition of marriage. Jesus later quotes this verse, quotes it when he's teaching on marriage. The apostle Paul also quotes this verse when he teaches on marriage. And I want you to notice something. Uh, in verse 23, when Adam's kind of talking about Eve and he sees her for the first time, he focuses on how she's, she's kind of separate from him. She's bone of my bones, the bone that's taken out of my bone, flesh that's taken out of my flesh. Uh, we'll call her woman, for she was taken out of man. He focuses on their separateness. But look what's ha what happens through marriage. They, they become united. They become one flesh. And sex is, is a part of that. See, what we learn in Genesis 2, 24 is that God's design for marriage is that it would be a man and a woman leaving the families that they come from. So they leave their families. They become united to one another. Really, in every way, they unite themselves to one another and they become one flesh. Leaving, uniting, becoming one has always been God's design for marriage. And then the last verse of Genesis 2, we read this, that Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Now, nakedness here means more. It's, it's, it indicates more than just that they didn't have clothes on. It speaks to something much deeper as well. That, that, they, bo that they both fully knew each other. They both fully saw each other. They were fully vulnerable with one another. And they also were fully loved and fully accepted just as they were. This is God's beautiful, beautiful perfect design for what marriage 
would be all about. The, the late pastor Tim Keller says it like this, that sexual intimacy is like a covenant renewal ceremony. We do with our bodies what we have promised to do our whole life. This beautiful, beautiful picture. Um, marriage was designed to be about intimacy in a way that was so much bigger than just sex. It was designed to be this picture of the sort of relationship, that oneness, that deep, exclusive, personal relationship that God desires to have with each and every one of us. This is why it's such a beautiful picture, because it's not just, marriage actually isn't just for married people. It's for anyone who can look at it, single people, kids, that they can look at a marriage that's, that's, that's together the way God designed it, and they can see a picture of the relationship and the sort of relationship that God desires to have with us. So that was God's design. What, what happened? What happened? If that's just a beautiful, like masterful picture then why have so few of us ever had an experience with marriage or sexuality that that seems to to match that? I can tell you this. The problem is is sin. Chapter 2, Genesis chapter 2, ends with Adam and Eve fully one, fully vulnerable, fully secure in their relationship and unashamed. And then chapter 3 begins like this. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. And the serpent deceives Eve, and Eve disobeys God. Maybe you've heard of the forbidden fruit. This is, this is actually what the scripture says. It says, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. And for the very first time, people disobeyed God. This is the very first instance where where humans created in the image and likeness of God acted outside of that image and outside of that likeness. And immediately, all of creation experiences this deep brokenness. I mean, immediately, we see see the impact. Where there was no shame, all of a sudden, there's shame. Where there was full security in that relationship between Adam and Eve, all of a sudden, for the first time, there's insecurity. And what did Adam and Eve do? They tried to hide their bodies from one another. They tried to hide from God. When they're confronted, they feel shame. They they blame each other. They they blame the serpent. And then we see even more fallout as death occurs for the first time. As an animal's life was taken to create coverings for Adam and for Eve, they're, they're sent out of the garden, which represents them being removed from the presence of, of God, from, from, from the safety of, of his presence. Work and life all of a sudden become toilsome. This perfect picture that God had intended. He and humanity in perfect union with one another. Man and woman with this perfect union. Broken. Genesis 2 ends with perfect people, in a perfect world, perfect relationship with God and with each other. Chapter three ends with broken people in a broken world, separated from a relationship with God and separated even from themselves. And because, one thing I want you to see is because sex and sexuality and gender were all a part of God's design before the fall, before sin, they're all impacted as well. We're like, if you, if you have your Bible, Genesis 3, we're like a page into this thing. It's like, it's a big book. We're one page in. And we're left with questions like, is this, like, is this the end? Is, is humanity doomed? Is God's really good creation? And was he wrong? Are, are we just like not so good? What are, what are we gonna do about this? What are Adam and Eve gonna do about it? Are they even gonna be a thing anymore? What, what is God going to do about this? Well, thankfully, God wasn't done with humanity yet. God actually had a plan for how he was going to redeem and restore all of creation back to himself. And we actually get a glimpse as to how he planned to do that right in Genesis 3. So after Adam and Eve sin, God has some words for them, but he also has some words for the serpent. This is what he says. 
He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. God says, he says, this, there's gonna be an offspring of Eve that is going to crush the head of the deceiver and his deception. It's like page one or two of the Bible. And the whole rest of the Bible, all of it, is about God fulfilling this promise. The whole thing. All 66 books, 40 authors, thousands of years from all walks of life. The entire Bible is a story about Jesus. It all points to Jesus because Jesus was God's plan on how he was going to redeem and restore all creation back to the way he designed us to be. And again, because sexuality and, and marriage even were, were part of God's design before sin, Jesus redeems and restores those things as well. The question then, as we read through scripture, is, is how? How does Jesus do this? And Jesus actually starts answering that question through his teaching. Through what Jesus taught, he started to give us a glimpse of what God's intention for, what his design was for, and what that could look like in the way we, we live our lives. In the book of Matthew, we, we read many of Jesus' teachings. We, we get some specific teachings around sexuality as he talks specifically about adultery and lust and divorce. In, in one of his sermons, Jesus says this. He goes, you've heard it was said that you should not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And right away we see that Jesus, when he thinks about adultery, he thinks of it as way bigger and, 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 that, and that it starts way before you're ever like in, you're in the bed with someone that's not your spouse. He's like, actually, adultery starts when, whenever we begin to look at someone lustfully. And, th and that means that this is important for, for every one of us. He says, he's, what he's saying is anytime we objectify another human being, when we look at someone who is created in the image of God, mind, soul, body, spirit, and we see them as just like a sexual creature, or if we look at them as if they're just a body, we're missing the mark of God's good design. And he's like, look, God's actually got something so much better for you than whatever lust has for you. Later in the same sermon, Jesus talks about divorce. And, and as he's talking about divorce, he even acknowledges that in this world, in, in, in this earth, there are some times where, where divorce is unavoidable. And he, and he goes so far as to say, actually, this is why. Because, because it's sometimes unavoidable, God actually gave you some instructions on when and how to actually end a, a marriage covenant. But he says, he says look, look. Every time, even if you can justify it, anytime divorce happens, there's brokenness. And we know that, right? So many of us have experienced the pain and brokenness of maybe your own marriage, maybe the marriage of your parents or sibling or, or friend. Jesus is like, look, it's, it's self-evident by the brokenness that's always involved in divorce that that was not God's design. Later, uh, Jesus is asked some questions, some further questions about his teachings on, on divorce. Some Pharisees actually came to him and to test him. And they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? And here's where Jesus quotes uh, Genesis 2. He says, haven't you read that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. And then Jesus adds this. He says, so they are no longer two. But one flesh, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. He's like, look, God's, God's design for marriage is better than just beautiful and good. It's perfect. But sin, just, it's just distorted our perfect picture. It's convinced us that what's good is actually not good. And, that, and he's like, he, he just... You gotta see it like God sees it. In fact, uh, uh, Jesus goes on to say, it was not this way from the beginning. There was something better. And actually the something better was, was really about the oneness and the unity that God longs to have with us. The marriage was always meant to be a picture that points us back to our personal relationship with God. 
He's like, look, that's, it's just, it's so much better. And so he says to people, he says, here's what I want you to do. Repent, turn from whatever you've been going after. Come follow me. And if you follow me, you, you, you can trust that I can lead you to something better. And if it were only that easy, right? Yeah, yeah, you know what? What, what I'm living is not fulfilling. I'll just do what Jesus said. It's, of course, it's gonna be better. Right, if it was that easy, we'd all do it. But the truth is we have all been deceived. There is a deceiver who is deceiving, or as Jesus put it, there's a thief who's coming to rob God's creation of the good things he has for us. Jesus said it like this. He says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. Or in other words, as it relates to this conversation, the enemy would like to own the narrative about sex and sexuality. Uh, one way I, I've seen that our culture has been deceived uh, is, is in this idea that just for, for whatever reason, our society just as a whole is kind of bought into this idea that, that sex is just physical. And we know that's not true. We know that God designed this to be the, the uniting of two people. This is becoming one flesh in every way. But anytime we try to take the components out, yeah, I'll take the relational thing out, I'll take the emotional thing out, I'll take the physical thing out, what we're left with is a wound. And honestly, the further we get away from God's design, the more self-evident the wounds become. This is why the Apostle Paul, at least part of why he writes this, he says, flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. He's basically saying, like, God knew what he was doing when he created this. And he created sex perfectly in line with the way that he created you. And so he's like, you actually can't violate this part of God's design without violating yourself. So he says, flee from it. Run away from sexual immorality. And I actually really appreciate that Paul uses the term sexual immorality here. And he doesn't just list off a bunch of stuff. Because sexual immorality is a blanket term. That when we really think about what it involves, it means that we're all guilty, right? And we, we could try to name some things. We could point out, you know, sex outside of marriage. Jesus, Jesus mentioned lust, adultery, divorce. We could, we could point to, to any sort of version of sex where we try to take the physical or the real life out of it, right? Pornography has created a whole world where people trade a bond with a spouse for a bond with a screen. And, and our our Society seeing the, the impact of that. I mean, that's not God's design. Neither is like hookup culture where it's like, oh, just well, there's no emotional connection here, no relational connection. We're just having a good time. That's not God's design. Sexual immorality could, in, could, involve, could include uh, any same-sex sexual behavior, open marriages. It, it includes obviously any sort of sexual assault or, or violence or, or harassment, anything like that. It, it includes the, the, the fallout of the purity culture, like your body's bad or sex is bad or, or pleasure's bad. None of that is God's design. And we could keep going, but if I probably covered everyone in the room, yeah? Probably lapped the room two or three times already. I mean, I'm in there. And if not, can I just be honest? You ought to be extremely, extremely grateful the truth is a deceiver has deceived all of us. We all have a, a tainted picture of God's beautiful, masterful design. And so Paul says, flee from this. Run from any form of sex that doesn't look like God's beautiful design and run to the one who created you because the one who created you is also the one who made a way for you to be restored and redeemed. See, we live on in, in a time and in a culture where, the, where, honestly, the brokenness, especially sexual brokenness, is just so self-evident. It's self-evident. But we also live on the other side of the resurrected Jesus. And Jesus did more than just come and teach a better way. He did that. But then he, he died for us. He died for our sins. And here's the thing about sin is, is actually the consequence for sin is death. We see that in the garden when Adam and Eve sin and what happens is there's an animal's life is taken to cover them. We see it again on, on the cross where Jesus, because of his absolutely immeasurable love for us, he demonstrated that love by giving his life for our sin. And by dying on the cross, one thing that Jesus did is he actually affirmed the fullness of the truth of the consequence for our sins. 
But then he rose from the dead. And in rising from the dead, he also poured out the full measure of God's grace for our sin as well. So that while all of us have been deceived and all of us are guilty of sin, that's not the end of the story. It's not the end of your story. It's not the end of my story. Because Jesus is risen. And he's, and he's, he's died for us. And then he invites us all into living a whole new sort of life. Maybe you've heard the phrase born again. This is where it comes from. Jesus is like, Jesus is like okay, I, I've died for you, so now I'm calling you to come and step into a whole new way of seeing life, a whole, na- a whole new way of living life. And that starts by turning to him and receiving the full measure of God's truth and grace. And the way we do that is through repentance. That's the word Jesus used. It just means turn. Whatever path you're on, repentance means turn in the direction of Jesus and follow him. And it's only through Jesus that we can come to know that beautiful, perfect, oneness relationship that God always longed to have with us. And that's actually good news for all of us. I, I read a part of the verse John 10, 10 earlier about the thief coming to steal, kill, and destroy. The second half goes like this. It's so good. He says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But then Jesus said, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. Because Jesus lived and died and rose from the dead, we have the opportunity to live life the way God always designed it. In fact, Jesus invites us to come and through him have life, he says, to the full. The question for really all of us today is, how will you respond to that invitation? How will you respond? Will you turn? Will you repent and receive the fullness of his truth and grace? Will you flee sexual immorality? Do you trust that he actually has something better for you? Here's the challenge with that invitation. Is we all have a story. We all have a past. We all have that thing that happened to us, the thing we did. And we got a deceiver that's, that's going to try to deceive us. It's going to try to tell us that's the story. And it's going to drive us to shame. It's going to drive us to hide that thing. It's going to drive us to blame someone else. We, we learned this from Adam and Eve. Shame, hide, blame. It's the story. And what that does is it keeps us, it keeps us in sin. It keeps us not only in sin, it keeps us from something better. The beauty of the invitation of Jesus is he says, you just come to me just like your. Their story doesn't have to be your story. The story of history, the story of Adam and Eve doesn't have to be yours. You can actually come to your heavenly father just as you are. Everything, just bring it all. And and if you were here Easter, you you remember we said, we said you're never too far from God. In fact, in the midst of you feeling like, I just, I don't know if I can bring it. He's saying, no, come on. He's like, he's like, try me. There's nothing. There's no thing, nothing that you've said, done, felt, thought that one, that he doesn't already know about. And two, that he hasn't already paid for on the cross. So he says, you just bring all that. Bring it all to me. I can handle it. My love for you is so much bigger than any of that. That that, that is the message of the cross. That in the middle of all that, Jesus died for us. He wiped the slate clean for us. He says, "I'll, I'll carry all your guilt, all of it. I'll carry all the shame, all of it. I'll carry all your sin, all of it on my back. And you just come walk with me. Come, because I'm going to a place that's better. I've got something better for you. I've actually got a life that you were designed for. Question we all got to wrestle with this. Will you, will you trust it? I need to wrap this up. Um, last week, if you were here, uh, our pastor, Tony, our lead pastor, shared a phone number with you and said, hey, if you're struggling with something and you just, you're kind of at the end of your rope and you don't really ha- know what to do, he said, you just reach out to him and, and he'll help you. I want to do the same. Uh, here's, here's my phone number. This is my cell phone number. So don't abuse it, but go ahead, use this. If, if you're at a place where you're like, I just don't even know how to process what I'm going through. I don't have it. I don't have a marriage. I don't know what to do with it. 
And will you reach out to me? I, I don't know if I can answer your question, but I can promise you that I care deeply about you and I'm willing to, to go on the journey of figuring out how to help you take a next step. So will you, do, will you use this if you need it? And, and we'll, can we just kind of all do this for each other? Can we extend this same sort of heart to one another? Not, hey, I've got it all figured out, so come learn from me. Hey, hey, I'm on this journey to figure out what it means to follow Jesus. I'd love to walk with you. Can we, can we extend this sort of heart to one another? Because here, here's what, what will happen if we do, and this has been my prayer for our church, is that if we'll, we'll kind of step into the journey of following Jesus together, my prayer is that we'll, we'll come to know deeply, we'll experience what, what the Apostle Paul called the surpassing worth. Now, just imagine that, the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray. God, you are, you are awesome. You are everything. You are creator. You are the preserver. You're the governor of, of all things and, and of us. And God, when we think about our sexuality. It's an area that many, many of us have gone through seasons where we struggled to trust you with. So God, um, we open our hearts in our lives, in our minds to you um, so that you will, you will fill us as you pour yourself out, that you'll fill us with the fullness of your, of your grace and the fullness of your truth so that, God, we may live out of that, the life you designed us to live, life to the full. May we receive from you this beautiful gift. And, and celebrate with joy the life you've, you've designed for us. God, give us grace for, for our past and give us grace as we stumble in to what's next. Um, and let's do it together in Jesus' name. Amen. So...